Hello, welcome to the California Telehealth Policy Coalition Legislative Briefing, Telehealth Policy, where we've been, where are we are now, and where are we going? My name is Mei Kwong, and I'm the Executive Director of the Center for Connected Health Policy, which convenes the California Telehealth Policy Coalition. The California Telehealth Policy Coalition was formed as of an ad hoc committee back in 2011 when AB 415, the Telehealth Development Act, was going through the legislative process. It began with just about five organizations interested in the progression of that bill and updates during its legislative journey. However, once the bill was signed and passed, the, the organizations that met continued to meet regarding the implementation of AB 415 and to get information or be aware of any telehealth policy development in the state of California. That coalition grew from five groups to now over 165 organizations, both statewide and national, that are interested in California telehealth policy. If you would like more information on telehealth policy coalition, how to join it, and our monthly meetings, please see the link below or contact CCHP for more information. The objectives for today's webinar is to discuss recent state telehealth policy updates, both in a, on the federal and the state level, and in a broader concept on where we may be going with it. We'll provide an overview of state policy issues as well as on federal policy issues. We'll discuss stakeholder perspectives on the impacts on patients, and we'll have a panelist discussion from our expert panelists on recent issues impacting state telehealth policy. We hope to answer key questions about legislation as well and the future outlook for telehealth policy in the state of California. We would like to thank today's sponsors of this event, the California Healthcare Foundation, the Center for Connected Health Policy, Teladoc Health, and AARP California. Due to their generous support, we're able to like hold this particular informational briefing today. Today's agenda. First, I will give an overview of the state and federal telehealth policy landscape and a bit of history on how some of the telehealth policy has developed in the state of California. Then we'll have a panelist discussion moderated by Diana Camacho from the California Healthcare Foundation. Our speakers will include Daniel Grossman, Haley Major Mar Mardes, my apologies if I pronounced that wrong, Kelly Pfeiffer, Quinn Sheen, and Stacey Wittroff. So, Really quickly, a state and federal telehealth policy update on what has happened so far. As most people are aware, when COVID-19 hit, there were numerous changes both on the federal and the state level that needed to be made on telehealth policy. Now, these, this slide here represents the changes that were made in general, both on the federal and the state level. And as you can see, there's some commonalities as far as what telehealth policies were touched upon. For example, the types of services that would be reimbursed, the location of the patient, and the type of provider who might be providing services. Um, but there were also certain issues, policy issues, that were exclusively either on the federal side to address or on the state side to address. For example, HIPAA is a federal issue, whereas licensure is a state issue. But overall, from this very high level overview, you can see that there were numerous policy changes that needed to be enacted in order to like facilitate the use of telehealth in addressing COVID-19. Big question now is, most of these changes or practically all these changes were temporary changes. So what remains? What is it going to look like going forward once the public health emergencies are declared over both on the federal and on the state level? We'll start first with what's going on on the federal level. So just to give you an idea of like the activity that has happened so far, CCHP actually tracks federal legislation as well. And we've been tracking over 200 pieces of legislation related to telehealth in some way. A lot of those bills do look at trying to either extend the temporary changes or make some of those temporary federal changes permanent. Thus far, none of those bills have really moved forward too much. There was a Cheney bill that would extend a lot of the temporary policies out for a couple of years that did pass out of the House, but it's been stalled in the Senate. But for the most part, those individual telehealth related bills have not really progressed too far. What has happened is that there have been telehealth policy elements put into larger bills, specifically two budget bills, one for 2021 and one for 2022. And what they have done 
the 2021 bill actually did not address any of the temporary changes made in response to COVID-19. What it did do was expand slightly the use of telehealth in the Medicare program when addressing mental health issues. And what they did was they removed the geographic limitation. So on the federal level with Medicare, there is like a geographic limitation for telehealth services and needs to take place in a specific type of geographic location, a rural location that has a specific definition. It also needs to take place in a specific type of facility, usually a medical facility. So they had like limited um, allowances for services in the home, but not, not a lot. It was a very narrow scope of services that can take place in the home. In the budget bill for 2021, they removed that geographic limitation when providing mental health services and they allowed the home to be an eligible originating site with um, when you're providing mental health services, but they put caveats on that. They said you can only do that if you meet certain requirements. And one of the big ones was that there was a visit, an in-person visit with a telehealth provider and the patient at least six months prior to when those telehealth services started. So there was an expanded expansion to the policy, but it was a very narrow expansion because there were all these pre-existing requirements that needed to be met before you could actually do it. In the 2022 budget bill, again, they didn't necessarily address making temporary changes permanent, but what they did was create a grace period for some of the federal temporary changes. Um, so what they did was in this grace period, which would be 151 days after the PHG, they would allow certain providers to continue to provide services in the Medicare program via telehealth and be reimbursed for them. And those um, providers were FQHCs, RHCs, PTs, and OTs, and speech language pathologists. So again, a very sort of narrow exception, um, but now we know that at least certain things would be extended through 151 days after the page E, even if no policy changes have happened. Now, they didn't do all of their federal temporary waivers. They did not include all of those in that 151-day grace period. For example, the prescribing exception. So once there was public health emergency declared, there is an exception in federal law that says you can use telehealth to prescribe a controlled substance if there is a public health emergency declared and the telehealth provider does not need to have an in-person examination of the patient. That will go away once the public health emergency is declared over. That was not an exception that Congress put into their uh, 2022 budget bill like they did with the grace period. So there are certain temporary waivers on the federal level that as uh, things stand now with, with the policies that we know they exist will disappear as soon as that public health emergency is declared over. But some of the stuff will stick around for um, 151 days. Also, there have been regulatory changes to the Medicare program um, through the regulatory process, usually something called the physician fee schedule. For those who are not familiar with it, the physician fee schedule is a bunch of policies that CMS uh, introduces every year for like the following year or for a future date. And those are changes that they're making to the Medicare policies and coverage. So they usually do a lot of telehealth changes um, in those regulatory, that regulatory process, usually adding additional services that will be reimbursed. Some of the physician fee schedule changes that have happened over the last couple of years have been to uh, create a temp, again, another temporary holding category of some of the services they allowed to be provided via telehealth during the pandemic, holding those over until the end of 2023. So that's one change that they've held. So we now we know that there's going to be at least some of these additional services that were available during COVID-19 be provided via telehealth that will stick around through 2023. Not all of them, but some. But what they also did as sort of their permanent policies was allow the use of audio only to provide mental health services. Again, with some caveats to it. So while they expanded the modality that can be used to provide mental health services, they added like some conditions to it in order to be able to use it. They also redefined what it meant for an FQHC and RHC when they provided a mental health visit to allow audio only and live video to be used as a way of providing that services. For those who are familiar with telehealth Medicare policy, you know that FQHCs and RHCs outside of this public health emergency do not qualify as a provider for telehealth services underneath the Medicare program, something which is very different than what a lot of states do, including California. 
However, because this was a redefinition of what a mental health visit meant for FQHCs and RACs, CMS was able to like make this change to allow them to use the modalities of live video and audio only to provide those services because they redefined what a visit meant for them, for these two entities. Now that also means that they're not considered a telehealth provider. They are still just providing a mental health visit and all those requirements and rules that they have to meet when providing mental health visit apply, but they're able to use live video and audio only to provide those services. So these are some of the permanent changes that we'll see once the public health emergency is declared over, or at least temp temporary changes that will stick around beyond the public health emergency for a period of time. What we're seeing overall that nationwide on the state activity is, again, audio only is an important issue or an important subject that has come up as far as are we going to keep it around as a permanent policy once a public health emergency is declared over. And we're seeing a lot of new coverage for audio only in the Medicaid programs if we look at all the Medicaid programs nationally. We're also seeing new payment parity laws before the pandemic. There were only about six states that had very specific payment parity laws for commercial payers. Um, required underneath their state laws. That's increased dramatically over the course of the pandemic, where we're now over 20 states, I think there are 24 states that have very specific state policies, state laws that say that you need to have payment parity with commercial payers. And we're also seeing more changes done around licensure as far as exemptions for out-of-state providers. We're seeing exemptions such as, you know, if there was already an established patient provider relationship and the patient is in a state just for like a temporary period of time, perhaps they're traveling for a vacation or if they're a college student. We're seeing clarity in those types of policies policies being implemented that maybe were very vague or unspoken about like before the pandemic. So just really quickly, like an overview of what's going on on another state, live video always been popular in Medicaid program to be used. So all the states in DC are reimbursing for live video in some way. Real patient monitoring and uh, storm for it made a little less progress during the pandemic. And that actually, these were actually two modalities that were not really highlighted or really like focused on during the pandemic, you really saw more about live video and audio only. And audio only is the big change that we've seen there. There's now 34 states and DC that allow in their Medicaid program some sort of audio only reimbursement as well too. I talked about payment parity and how there have been changes to like the payment parity laws. That's what we're seeing on the commercial side of things, commercial payer side of things as far as telehealth policy changes. Other federal issues that we're starting to see crop up or more being talked about more are concerns around fraud or misuse or abuse of uh, funds there. So what we have seen is that at least the OIG has come out. So the Office of Inspector General and said like, before the pandemic, we actually didn't find a whole lot of fraud around telehealth. What, we, what we've seen and what a lot of news stories have been have been more around telemarketing fraud rather than actual telehealth fraud where people were billing were being bad actors and billing for telehealth services. It was more related to like ordering a, a durable medical equipment or an, uh, not necessary uh, lab test or prescribing of that type of nature. It wasn't necessarily around telehealth fraud. They did do a study on what had happened during the pandemic and they did find a couple of cases where they said that there was you know, possibility of fraud or, or abuse there. But that made up probably, I think, less than 1% of like all of the telehealth uh, submissions or reimbursement submissions that Medicare had received. So a very small amount there that they have found so far. Cross-state practice issues, such as licensure and prescribing requirements, again, something that has been on the radar for a lot of people, not only on the state level, but also on the federal level as well. Licensure is on like the the state side of things to like control, but it's been a concern of, on the federal level with federal policymakers regarding, you know, like, you know what are we going to do about licensure? Because we do, did have this problem in the early days of the pandemic of people were either stuck in states or they're traveling to take care of like, you know, sick relatives and they still wanted to access their per 
their providers from home, but perhaps they couldn't even through telehealth because of licensure issues. So concerns about that as well too. And also we'd be remiss if we didn't talk about like the Dobbs decision a little bit. That could also have impact on the use of telehealth, not only around prescribing, but also when you're talking about these cross-state licensing, these cross-state issues that come up not only with licensure, but other types of things related to when you're crossing a border and trying to provide services to a patient in another state. On the California health, California telehealth side of things, I mentioned this earlier since CCHP was involved with AB 415. That was the tele Telehealth Development Act of 2011. It was uh, authored by Assemblymember Loke. Uh, it was an update to the 1996 Telemedicine Act. So certain things that had happened um, underneath uh, 415 was really to try to update this, this language that has been around for, at that point, um, 15 years at that point. So it was probably time to like look at it and refresh it and see if like it kept pace with development of technology. So there was well, some of the changes that were made were more expansive definition of what um, telehealth meant. It replaced the term telemedicine. There were more sort of explicit requirements on what a commercial payer was to do and what Medicaid would cover as well too. Other sort of legislation that has happened in California related to telehealth over the years, we had in 2014, sort of like a little bit of a clarification and cleanup language to uh, 415 regarding consent, allowing to use either oral or written um, consent as well for before telehealth services take place. AB 744 in 2019, an Agua Curry bill around private payer reimbursement parity, clarifying that, making that very explicit. And then an AB um, in 2019, also AB 1264, the Petri Norris bill clarified that an appropriate examination does not require synchronous interaction. So clarify existing policy at that point that perhaps was a little bit unclear in previous laws, but making it a little bit more explicit. So what we saw in California during COVID is actually California was in a better position than a lot of states going into the pandemic because Medi-Cal had actually updated their telehealth policies literally six months before the pandemic hit. So the state itself was in a little bit better position than other states who that had to make a lot of different changes to accommodate the use of telehealth. So California still had to make changes, especially around how MQHCs were um, providing services or could provide services via telehealth. But the big one was also that audio only concept as well too, because California like really practically every other state was not allowing audio only to be used to provide services. Well, almost nobody was, but due to the fact that not everybody has access to broadband or to devices, a laptop perhaps, or a smartphone, you still needed to get services to folks. So audio only was the only way. California, again, was also in the same position as everybody else. It's like, what are we going to keep around after this pandemic? What are we going to make permanent? And we saw some clarity this year as far as what is going to be happening. So we saw that, you know, interestingly enough, very similar to the federal side of things, we saw that in a budget bill as opposed to like a siloed sort of telehealth bill. So in the budget bill, there some of the permanent changes that will be adopted would be their continued coverage and payment parity for synchronous and asynchronous, which was what was around before the pandemic. But now also they're going to include audio only as well too, and a lot of QHCs and RHCs to do that as well too. They are also um, going to allow patients can be established uh, via live video with their some except limited exceptions to asynchronous for FQHCs and RHCs. And also um, there's going to be some additional clarifications on like what consent requires we need to be met. So there's going to be before the pandemic, it, the, the law only required and Medi-Cal only required that you receive obtain consent prior to telehealth services taking place from the patient. It can be either oral or written. There's going to be additional things that Medi-Cal is going to require of Medicaid, Medi-Cal in um, providers and when they're servicing Medi-Cal enrollees as well too. Also what we had was AB 32 was passed as well. That is sort of, you know, a bit of a companion to this and then that it would um, allow the audio only exceptions for sensitive services um, for uh, uh, FQHCs and RHCs there. Um, and that there needed to be an attestment to lack of access to live video as well too. Um, other things that were sort of, 
in, interesting to know is like all of this was around Medi-Cal. So there really wasn't anything changed though for commercial payers. So you do have like sort of different tracks or different requirements that are going to be placed upon Medi-Cal providers and enrollees and what commercial payers see as well too. Additionally, like other uh, government agencies, other Medicaid programs, uh, like the federal government, there's also interest in getting more information on the impact and the use of tele as well. So the Department, the Department of Healthcare Services will be developing a research and evaluation plan, looking at some of these questions that have come up around, you know, usage and utilization and, and efficacy as well too. So this is like a very, very high level overview, just really quick as well. There is more information on CCHP's website that delves into this in a little bit more detail, but also our incredible panelists will be discussing this in a little bit more detail as well too, and the impacts that they see and sort of like where areas maybe weren't necessarily addressed or weren't fully addressed with some of these changes that are going to be questions, going to be issues that we see going forward that will still need to be discussed and addressed in some way. So I'm gonna turn it over to our moderator today who is Diana Camacho. She is Senior Program Officer at the California Healthcare Foundation where she is on, um, where she is on the Improving Access Team which works to improve access to coverage and care for Californians with low incomes. Diana leads CHCF's body of work on telehealth, and most recently, she worked at Kaiser Permanente, and she has additional healthcare and public health experience in the areas of public policy, language access, community needs assessment, and diversity, equity, and inclusion, and I turn it over to Diana. Thank you so much, May. I'm thrilled to be here today with such an esteemed and wonderful panel, as well as the expertise from the California Telehealth Policy Coalition. Okay, before I kick off the panel, I just wanted to make a few remarks. Um, at CHCF, the California Healthcare Foundation, we are pursuing many approaches to ensure that our state's 14 million Medi-Cal enrollees, 80% of whom are people of color, have timely access to high quality primary specialty and behavioral health care. One approach to doing that we really believe is telehealth, and we've been supporting the adoption of telehealth for the better part of 15 years. This effort has included support of the important work of the California Telehealth Policy Coalition, which brings together all these stakeholders to sh and to share a vision on advancing telehealth policy and payment. I really think we're at an exciting juncture for telehealth policy in California. Many of the pandemic era policies, as May mentioned, were recently made permanent and telehealth is representing on average, according to recent CHDF data, about a third of primary care and two thirds of behavioral health care delivered in the California safety net. That's based on some survey work that CHDF has done. That is a lot of health care. So I would argue that we really need to stay focused on telehealth, including the policy and practices that promote telehealth that is high quality, cost effective, patient centered, and absolutely um, necessary that it also be equitable. With this charge, um, I'm delighted to be here today moderating today's panel discussion with such an esteemed and influential group of leaders in this space, um, where we're going to discuss the implications of these new telehealth policies in a quote unquote post pandemic world, if we're allowed to say that. So I'll start by introducing our panelists, and I'll note before I do that that our two um, wonderful provider panelists, Dr. Grossman and um, Dr. Pfeiffer, are going to have to jump off a little bit early because they have important duties to see to. Um, so, but they're going to um, touch on many of um, they think the high points in their opening comments. So what I'll do first is I'll go ahead and introduce our speakers and then I'll open it up to each of them to um, make some brief opening comments and then we'll jump into some, some questions. So I'll start by on introducing Dr. Daniel Grossman. He's an OBGYN and researcher based at UCSF where he is a professor and director of Advancing New Standards and Reproductive Health. His research includes both clinical and social science studies aimed at improving access to contraception and abortion, including a focus on the use of telehealth for family planning. Um, next up, we'll have Haley Major Mardeas, who joined, who's with the California Association of Public Hospitals. Uh, she joined that organization in 2017. Haley's work focuses on developing, shaping, and advancing policies that aim to strengthen public health care systems' ability to deliver equitable, high-quality care, including policies related to FQHCs, telehealth, pharmacy, workforce, health information exchange, and other areas. We also have joining us today, Dr. Kelly Pfeiffer is a family physician, a policy consultant, and an abortion provider in Kansas and California, and until recently also in Arizona. She was appointed by Governor Newsom as the Deputy Director of Behavioral Health from 2019 through uh, May 2022, leading behavioral health policy for the California Department of Healthcare Services. Prior to joining the state, she worked at CHCF, 
shout out to um, my organization, San Francisco Health Plan, Petaluma Health Center, and Redwood Community Health Coalition. We also have joining us today, Quinn Sheen, who is a strategist and regulatory advisor that works with clients at the intersection of law, policy, and politics. She has led multiple campaigns across the country to promote adoption of virtual care and to remove outdated regulatory barriers that restrict consumer choice and stall development of innovative healthcare solutions. Quinn serves as a strategic advisor at Tusk Venture Partners, the first venture capital fund and political strategy firm dedicated to working with and investing in startups operating in regulated industries. And last but last not least, we'll have Stacey Whitorf, who serves as the Associate General Counsel for Planned Parenthood Affiliates of California, where she provides in-house legal support for the organization. She works closely with um, the organization's advocacy teams and affiliate-led work groups to develop and implement the organization's legislative and policy priorities and to provide support for health center operations. So we got quite the panel ahead of us. Um, to jump us into opening works, I will start with Dr. Grossman. Thank you so much. Um, thanks for that introduction and for the inter the invitation to join the panel today. So, um, as um, as you noted, I I'm based at UCSF, where I direct a research program in the OBGYN department. And one focus of my research uh, is on the use of uh, telemedicine to provide medication abortion. And I conducted the first study that looked at documenting the safety and effectiveness of this approach, um, as well as the high level of patient satisfaction with, with telemedicine um, medication abortion. That first paper was published over a decade ago, but it really wasn't until the COVID-19 pandemic um, that providers really began to use telemedicine widely to provide medication abortion. And now we have a great deal of evidence um, that this model of care um, with the medication sent using a, a mail over pharmacy is safe, effective, and well liked by patients. And it's really become uh, a standard of care here in California. Um, the US FDA has also endor endorsed the practice um, and has permanently removed the in person dispensing requirement for mifepristone, which is one of the drugs used in, in medication abortion. Um, but in the face of the Supreme Court's decision in Dobbs v. Jackson Women's Health Organization, um, which uh, eliminated federal protections to abortion care, I think really more work is needed to explore how telemedicine, telehealth can be used to ensure access to safe services uh, for people living in states with abortion bans. As of today, uh, 13 states have completely banned abortion. Uh, Georgia has a six week ban. There are seven other states that have bans that have been temporarily blocked by the courts. Um, people who are living in these states generally have to travel more than 500 miles and, and often quite a bit more than that um, in order to access care uh, in a state where it's still legal. So last legislative session here, um, several uh, so-called shield laws were passed to protect um, those of us who provide abortion care here in California to patients who may travel from a state with severe restrictions. These include AB 1666, which limits civil liability for providers, uh, AB 2626, which protects the medical, nursing, uh, and PA licenses from sanction due to a, compl a complaint from another state's board for providing legal abortion care here, uh, and AB 1242, which uh, limits criminal investigation and arrest of providers for perform performing or aiding in the performance of an abortion. And these protections are all really critical. Um, but they only protect the provision of care uh, that's given to a patient who is physically located here in California. Given the tremendous need um, for safe abortion services, as well as the advances in using telemedicine to safely provide medication abortion, um, some California clinicians are asking if these shield laws could be extended to protect telemedicine provision of medication abortion across state lines, uh, including to patients who are in states with abortion bans. As you know, generally telemedicine is viewed as occurring where the patient is, uh, and the clinician generally needs to be licensed where the patient is uh, and must comply with all relevant laws and regulations of the state or jurisdiction where the patient is. Um, however, really neither of these would really be possible uh, if the patient is located in a state with an abortion ban. While it may seem complicated to think about how such a shield law could be constructed, um, Massachusetts was able to do it. Uh, there, the legislature passed a bill um, this year, which the governor signed, um, that protects both reproductive health care and gender affirming care in much the same way that the California laws do, um, 
as long as the clinician is licensed and physically located in Massachusetts. Um, but the difference is that the law specifically says that, it, that this protection is enforced regardless of where the patient is located. Um, several providers in Massachusetts have expressed interest in providing telemedicine medication uh, abortion across state lines. Um, perhaps you saw the, the New York Times Magazine piece on Sunday that highlighted this issue. Um, for many independent abortion providers here in California, it is a real priority for the upcoming legislative session to figure out how to extend the shield laws to protect telemedicine provision of medication abortion across state lines. We know that the protections will be limited. Um, for example, if we were to travel to a state where care, where the care was provided um, or potentially to another state that might extradite us to the state where we might be accused of a crime. Um, but some providers are willing to accept those risks uh, in order to provide people with safe medical care that they need and, and should be able to access. Um, my time is just about up, but I, in case I have to jump off before this issue is addressed, I did just want to mention one thing um, related to the evaluation of telemedicine services. Um, I, I think that really any attempt to, to evaluate telemedicine services, um, including you know, trying to understand the extent to which such services provide equitable care, really has to include patient perspectives. Like it can't just be based on, on utilization data. Um, we at ANSWER at UCSF are currently conducting a study of telemedicine provision of medication abortion in several states. And one issue that we're exploring is whether prior experiences of mistreatment in medical services, including um, mistreatment due to racism, is associated with an interest in and satisfaction with the telemedicine services. Um, so in addition to knowing whether people are using telemedicine services and whether they like the services, I think we really need to know if these services are better meeting the needs of patients who have not been well served by traditional in-person medical care. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Grossman. Couldn't agree more on uh, listening to patients on their needs on telehealth. Um, I'll hand it over now to Haley. Thanks, um, and nice to meet you all. I am really happy to be here and speak with you today about telehealth in the Medi-Cal program and just what it has meant for our members and their patients over the last two years and the value of making coverage for telehealth permanent and where we are headed. Um, so just by way of a bit of background, CAPH represents and serves California's 21 public health care systems, which include both county affiliated facilities as well as the UC Medical Centers. And our members really play a key role in providing care as part of the state's healthcare safety net. Um, we serve nearly 4 million patients a year and provide about 40% of all hospital care to the state's remaining uninsured population and over 35% of all hospital care to the Medi-Cal populations in the communities that we serve. We also serve a really diverse patient population with nearly 60% of our patients identifying as a person of color. Um, and in addition to the role that we play in providing hospital and trauma and burn care to our communities, we also uh, play an extensive role in delivering primary and specialty outpatient care. We provide over 10 million outpatient visits each year. Um, and prior to the pandemic, when telehealth coverage was just much more limited, really very few of our systems were providing telehealth services consistently as part of their care delivery. Um, and then when COVID hit, our members really jumped into action to dramatically shift their outpatient services from in-person services to telehealth. And at some points over the past two years, the majority of the outpatient visits that they were providing were via phone or video. Um, so from this experience, we really just quickly learned how valuable a tool telehealth um, has been to improve access and health outcomes, and just the role that it can play in reducing disparities in healthcare services and overcoming barriers for patients to come in um, to receive services in person. So things like transportation, taking time off of work or securing childcare, and then also in reaching um, some of our harder to reach patients. 
And I would say that the flexibility to provide phone visits in particular has been really, really critical for our members and the patients that we serve. Um, many of our patients do not have internet or computers at home, or they might have limited data plans for their phones. And so they just can't easily access and engage um, in visits through video. So it really has been crucial to see the coverage of phone visits continue on a permanent basis so that we can maintain that access point for patients. Um, and although in the beginning of the pandemic, our system's focus was largely just kind of on getting something up and running quickly and off the ground and, and figuring out how to deliver services virtually, um, today, they are very much focused on designing virtual care models to optimize their delivery of services, um, understanding how telehealth can be leveraged to improve quality outcomes, strengthening and standardizing workflows and coordination, and really figuring out the best way telehealth and in-person care can be integrated into this new hybrid world that we live in just to best serve their patients. Um, so as proud co-sponsors of AB32, we were very pleased to see the, the progression of the proposals um, that were advanced and considered by the legislature and the administration over the past two years as part of uh, both the budget and policy bill process, and where we finally landed with both video and phone visits being covered in the Medi-Cal program on a permanent basis and at parity to in-person reimbursement levels including for FQHCs, uh, which is really big. And now um, we are focused and looking forward um, to ensuring a smooth transition from the temporary flexibilities that were allowed during the public health emergency period to those that will take effect next year under the permanent policy. Um, but I look forward to just hearing what questions you all might have today and, and engaging um, in the panel discussion. And Diana, I will hand it back to you. Great. Thanks, Haley. Thank you for your leadership on AB32. Okay, handing it over to our next speaker for some comments, uh, Dr. Kelly Pfeiffer. It's a real honor to be invited to this forum. Thank you so much. Um, I'm calling you from my clinic in Kansas. I'm an abortion provider here at Trust Women, and honestly, I'm mostly seeing patients from Texas, along with people from Arkansas, Oklahoma, Missouri, and Louisiana. They leave at midnight from their home, stay at clinic all day, and drive back all night. So I wanted to just provide a little local color for why we, um, there's so many advocates who are hoping that we in California strengthen our shield laws uh, for abortion care. So these states that are feeding into Kansas right now did 80,000 abortions in 2020 and Kansas did 8,100. So this is a 10 to one difference in terms of capacity. So there's no way that my clinic and the local Planned Parenthood can expand capacity tenfold to meet the needs of East Texas, the biggest population centers, Missouri, Oklahoma, Arkansas. Um, most of these patients do not have the right IDs or resources to travel to California. So while we're very grateful for the huge um, strides that California made to being a reproductive haven state, at the same time, um, we know a lot of patients can't get to California. And so for every person I see, I know there's several who could not get through on the phone and are facing forced birth. I saw two 13 year olds this week, one of whom was 16 weeks because it took her several weeks for her mom to try and call and call and call and call until she can get an appointment. With telehealth, she could have had a pill abortion at home and could have trusted that pill abortion being from a prescriber in a state that would protect that prescriber. So I'm very proud to be a Californian. I'm proud of the investments that we've made, but I really hope we don't stop there because it's not enough. We're not going to be able to need, meet the need without allowing the independent providers who, as Dr. Grossman mentioned, are comfortable taking the risks. Um, and this will not be every provider. There's gonna be a small number of providers who are comfortable with us risk and telehealth across state lines is the only way we're gonna ensure that people who don't live in California can still make choices about when and where to parent. There is a legal pathway forward. We do not need to redefine telehealth. Um, Massachusetts paved the way by not tackling what telehealth means in terms of where the provider is, the patient is. It just said the provider is protected no matter where the patient is. We don't need to risk undoing California's licensing system. There's mechanisms to legally shield providers despite the constitutional full faith and credit clause. Um, there's, it's too detailed to go into the um, minutia here, but the bottom line legal analysis shows that these are not fugitive crimes because if I prescribe into Texas, I'm not 
doing a crime in Texas and then leaving Texas, I stay in California. And so California can choose to protect providers and not cooperate with extradition. So we're asking you to extend the protections we already have in law um, to those providers who are willing to, to do telehealth across state lines. And there are a, a number of providers who are, understand those risks and are ready to take them. Again, so much detail that we can't address in this forum, but we do look forward to future opportunities to discuss with legislators and legislative staff and advocates how California could protect us in these challenging years to come. So thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Pfeiffer, and thank you for the important work that you're doing, and we'll let you get back to work if you need to jump back into it. Thank you. Um, next up, we have Quinn Sheen with Tusk Venture Partners. Hi, everybody. It's great to be here with you today. Um, as they mentioned during the introduction, I am a state policy advisor for Tusk Venture Partners. I also work as the state policy advisor for the American Telemedicine Association and have worked with a number of companies over the last seven years and in thinking about telehealth policy in a way that it can be adapted to expand access to patient care while also keeping in place a lot of the protections that we have. Um, May talked about and did a better job than I could uh, as to how states have been looking at telehealth over the last two years. If we go to before times, let's say, when a, when a provider is thinking about launching a telehealth service, there were lots of, que lots of questions they need to always be asking. You know, who can deliver the care? Um, how do they do so? What technologies can they use? Where does the provider need to be? Where does the patient need to be? When in the patient relationship can you use telehealth? And the big question is, what can they get paid for? Um, each state answers all of those questions differently. Um, and prior to the pandemic, there were a few of us looking at those statutes, and we realized that many of them were ambiguous, they were silent, or they were really outdated and archaic. And the first time that many of those statutes and regulations were looked at was you know, at the onset of the pandemic. And that really prompted, as many kind of went through, a reexamination of policies that um, legislators and regulators realized that they needed to change on a temporary basis and then many of them over the last two years on the state level have made those permanent. Um, there's still work to be done. And with the PHE ending, the interplay between federal and state dynamics will be particularly interesting um, as we think whether state coverage requirements are gonna track what CMS is doing um, on the controlled substance piece. Um, as we talked about before, can, the federal government sets a floor. That does not mean that the states cannot go above that as to what types of prescribing they would like in their own states. Um, but generally the policies we're seeing and I've been tracking over the last and worked with policymakers over the last two years have kind of fallen into three buckets. Um, one is, you know, whether to maintain or expand coverage of various telehealth modalities, and as part of that, thinking whether any specific guardrails need to be in place. Um, the second is, how do we kind of future-proof our frameworks um, and build the infrastructure to allow the adoption of telehealth to be sustained? Um, and the third is, and this really speaks to what Dr. Grossman and Dr. Pfeiffer are, are, have touched on, is not only is telehealth can be replicating in-person um, care, but what new models can we support through technology? And I think that's always the most interesting because if we're if we're trying to fit you know the delivery of care into the old buckets and the old frameworks, we are going to be limited in its reach. Um, and so as with as with those three, you know, California has been a leader in a lot of ways in telehealth policy. Um, and if there's one thing to take away from this, it's to join the Telehealth Policy Coalition. I work, as I said, in many states. No state has an infrastructure like this. Um, so, so please get involved if this is uh, an issue that's important to you. Um, as I said, California has been a leader kind of in those three buckets. I think in the last year, they've done more um, on kind of maintaining coverage of certain telehealth modalities. Um, they've done a lot on building the infrastructure, particularly around broadband and at least talking about that, digital literacy tools, focusing on communities that might not be fully um, being able to access the benefits of telehealth. I think they can do more on using telehealth to leverage new models of care, um, hopefully going forward. Um, the last thing I'll say is there's three kind of policy, policy principles that guide where I think um, forward-looking telehealth policy um, goes. And one is focusing on the standard of care 
um, rather than the modality or the technology enabling the care. If we focus on whether the provider has the information they need to be taking the next steps, the patient's circumstances, frameworks that dictate down to the minutia as to what a provider may or may not do is not going to serve, in my opinion, the provider's um, delivery or the patient's uh, expectations. The second is we need to give predictability to providers, patients, and um, as to payment, as to what they can and can't do, and a real clarity of a framework. Um, telehealth is a one care setting. Um, I think we should should treat it as such and, and not subject it to higher requirements. And the third, and this has been touched on by all of our panelists, is we really need to keep the patient as the center of telehealth policy. And that goes to enabling new models of care and making sure that any guardrails or restrictions that we put in place are clinically necessary or have an incentive to actually protect the patient and are not arbitrary and based on where we think technology may or may not go. Uh, make it evidence-based and data-driven versus um, kind of hypotheticals as to how something could or could not potentially be subject to fraud. Um, so look forward to talking to you and um, thank you for letting me be here. Thanks, Quen. Really appreciate the global perspective. And I love your, your bullet points. I'm a big fan of a few takeaways. Appreciate it. Um, okay, Stacy with Planned Parenthood Affiliates of California. Yeah, hi. Good afternoon. Um, thank you, Diana, for the introduction earlier. And um, thanks for the opportunity to participate um, in today's panel and discussion. And in case folks aren't familiar with um, Planned Parenthood Affiliates of California or PPAC. Um, we represent the seven California Planned Parenthood affiliates, which collectively operate over 100 um, non-FQHC health centers throughout the state and provide 1.3 million patient visits annually. Um, that includes a wide range of sexual and reproductive health care services, as well as um, some primary care and behavioral health care. Um, about 85% of health center patients um, across the state access coverage, um, either through the Medi-Cal or uh, Family PAC program. So as part of um, Planned Parenthood's commitment to providing care that best meets patient needs, we have long advocated for increased flexibility with regard to the provision of care via telehealth. Um, with the you know, COVID pandemic, the California Planned Parenthood Health Center has found a lot of innovative ways to continue to deliver care through no touch and low touch um, you know, services to, to their patients relying really heavily um, on the use of telehealth. So I would say um, with regard to recent policy developments, um, you know, I'd say overall, we made a tremendous amount of progress over the past few years, um, especially to the extent that our policymakers have become a lot more familiar, um, maybe themselves, um, and through advocacy with the ways in which um, telecare, telehealth is actually used to provide care. So um, for the Planned Parenthood Health Centers, the adoption of payment parity has been really specific, um, significant, you know, particularly in, in Medi-Cal. Um, I, I think there's frequently a misconception that um, care delivered via telehealth modalities you know, is, is less work or it's less costly to provide. And um, for the Planned Parenthood Health Centers, which do operate brick and mortar facilities, providing care via telehealth is really an additive um, for patients that allows patients better access, but doesn't eliminate, you know, the costs associated with providing the care, um, you know, including um, in the provision of sexual and reproductive health care, you know, security and insurance costs. And so I would um, also note that the expanded availability of audio only and asynchronous telehealth modalities has been really significant. Um, as the uh, Planned Parenthood health centers in California are, are again, you know, forced to innovate in order to meet the increased demand for abortion care um, and contraceptive care in our state, you know, as others have talked about um, resulting from bans in other states and the, and the fall of Roe, um, you know, these changes are going to allow providers to meet patients where they are and to make um, certain services a lot more accessible. As far as issues remaining, um, to the extent the patients who receive care through Medi-Cal and Family Pact are treated differently with regard to the provision of telehealth, you know, in particular, 
with regard to consent requirements and the limit on their ability to initiate a relationship with a new provider via telehealth modality. Um, I think those need to be addressed in order to ensure that we're not creating a two-tier system of care. Um, and we also need to continue the discussion about how to utilize telehealth to mitigate you know, the abortion access issues that have existed in California prior to Dobbs um, and, and that have certainly been exacerbated by it. Um, I think part of that discussion too will need to include a, some careful consideration about how to best protect um, you know, both providers and patient privacy. Um, and I, yeah, I'm really excited to sort of delve into the conversation and, and it's been really interesting to hear folks' perspectives so far. So looking forward to some more of that today. Great. Thank you so much, Stacey. Yeah. Really appreciate your comments. I think you've touched on one of the questions we were going to discuss, which was some of the strengths and weaknesses of the audio only provisions. And I think we can circle back to that. But I'm interested, while we still have um, some of our providers on the line, I wanted to ask a little bit more about the research and evaluation plan that DHCS is um, planning to release in a few months. What recommendations would you have on what should be the focus and priority of that research and evaluation plan as we we need to understand how telehealth continues to evolve and work in, in the future. Um, and maybe I know Dr. Grossman, you kind of touched on this earlier around patient perspective. I don't know if you would have anything else to add. Um, yeah, I mean, I think I mostly said that, but I, I, I think um, collecting data directly from um, users and potential users is really critical. Um, you know, exploring things about, including about access to um, devices and, and preference for audio versus um, uh, you know, other modalities for, for the visits and yeah, really understanding, um, what potential barriers still are for patients to access telehealth. Great. Thank you. Quinn, anything you'd add? Sorry, is someone else can jump in? I just was wondering if I can pile on because of I course. think we'd be surprised. I think abortion might be a special case where we may learn that there may be more satisfaction with telehealth than in-person care for the people who are early in their pregnancy, because we've gotten very used to getting quickly what we need on Amazon, but the abortion um, ghettoization of care has led to the experience of getting abortion, sometimes being quite tough of having to experience, you know, go through protesters, or if you have to travel long distance, um, waiting in a clinic for a long time because the volume is gonna be unpredictable on that day. So I do think it's gonna be important to get to that detail about the experience of telehealth versus in-person and be prepared to be surprised if it's not what we expected. Really great point, Dr. Pfeiffer. And CHDF has done some surveying, not specifically on abortion, but on telehealth um, uh, preferences. And across the board, many groups prefer tele, really are satisfied with their telehealth use and prefer it for a lot of their care. Um, Quinn, would you add anything? Yeah, and I, I think building on what they said first, just the idea of telehealth or forming a relationship, whether it's asynchronously or via audio only with some exchange of information, that's that's a new way for all of us, the same way online banking or to conceptually think of, can you form a patient relationship with a provider that way? I think our providers on the phone could say yes, and they can have those back and forth interactions through modalities that traditionally don't exactly replicate the experience as we might think with video, right? That's the closest equivalent we have. But if the actual trust and communication and data is there in that exchange, you know, that should be our focus. Um, and I and I hope the research evaluation considers that. The second part is just around fraud. And I know May touched on this briefly. You know, we hear a lot of thoughts. We hear a lot of comments of like, but telehealth and fraud. And I know another panelist has really good insights on utilization connection. I, I think the question needs to be reframed. And I think DHS will get to that. And, and the question is whether, you know, Telehealth is uniquely exposing the Medicaid program to fraud. It is going to be a given probably that there could be potential for fraud as in any healthcare setting. It's whether the unique features of telehealth make it um, you know, more exposed. And the OIG report, at least on the Medicare side so far has said no. And we, as those in the telehealth community also need to continue the education as to a kind of proper billing where a lot of the incidences are occurring because there's confusion on providers on that. And second, differentiating those encounters, which are really telemarketing fraud from being what is legitimately telehealth. So I'm, I'm hoping um, that becomes part of the discussion as well. 
Thank you, Quinn. Um, Haley or Stacey, anything you'd add related to research and evaluation and telehealth? telehealth? Yeah, sure. Um, you know, just sort of building off Quinn's remarks, I, I'd say in the last few years, I think patients have become a lot more comfortable using telehealth and providers have really expanded um, their capacity to deliver care that way, um, you know, largely. Um, during the pandemic. And we've seen a considerable growth in utilization of telehealth, which has not necessarily had a corresponding decrease um, in the utilization of in-person services. And I know there, as, as Quinn was saying, you know, um, there have been some suggestions that the increase in telehealth utilization without the corresponding decrease um, is indicative of fraud or an overuse of services. And, and I, I, you know, I think it's more likely indicative of the challenge that a lot of Californians have long faced in accessing in-person services, um, of the fact that folks who haven't been able to access necessary care previously um, due to geographic transportation and financial barriers are getting that care and that, you know, telehealth has reduced those barriers. So I, I do think I would agree it's you know, crucial that as we shape an evaluation plan that we're looking not just at immediate increases in volume of services, but that we're considering sort of what that utilization is comprised of and what health outcomes are looking like over a longer term. I'd agree. Uh, there was, you know, some additional language in the AB32 around evaluating and trying to understand the degree to which telehealth was actually improving access and, and equity and helping to address uh, disparities in care. And that ended up being negotiated out. But I do believe that the department will be looking um, at how telehealth is uh, impacting access on different populations and examining this through um, an equity framework, but I will be really interested in learning more once they release their evaluation plan just on how they are addressing that. Um, another area that we've been really focused on in understanding is the intersection between telehealth and quality improvement and how telehealth can be leveraged to improve the quality of care. Um, so public hospitals um, participate in a pretty large scale pay for perform performance program in Medi-Cal called QIP. And what we've seen during the pandemic is that our performance on quality measures has actually suffered. Um, that might not be so surprising, but it's definitely you know, being driven by the workforce crisis that we're experiencing but also just not being able to get patients in for certain types of visits. And so what we're doing now is really trying to understand where telehealth can be leveraged to support improving our quality outcomes and looking at our high performing systems to understand how they're incorporating telehealth in their care delivery models, how they're leveraging virtual care to drive quality improvement, and then how we can share those learnings uh, more broadly with our membership to meet our quality improvement goals. Great, thank you, Haley. We have just a few minutes left and such a richness of conversation. Um, I wanna ask one more question before we, we have some any closing parting comments. We have some questions coming through related to the implementation of these new policies, questions around the complexities of how do we manage consent, prescribing? How do we manage all the different coverage options? I don't know if folks have any thoughts or advice in terms of uh, thinking around how to track all of this and some of the, um, some of the uh, potential bumps in the road in terms of implementation for these new policies. Quinn, do you have any thoughts on this in terms of thoughts on uh, implementing these new telehealth policy provisions? You're muted. Sorry, I was just trying to read the 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 questions in the Q and A. Um, you know, I'm I'm hopeful that the forthcoming <laughs> guidance from the department will give some ideas to that. Um, is particularly regarding to some of the new consent requirements and what you know. There's a there's a few parts just to go back to the medic to the the new Medicaid policies, and we've all talked about this. May touched on this. There are a lot of new specific requirements just you know, for Medi-Cal providers that would not be operable in commercial pay or cash pay. And so updating 
you know, your delivery of care to account for those. Consent is a pretty big one to pay attention to. As I said, I'm hoping that we'll have more guidance there. Um, making sure that you have, uh, at this point, a multimodal system. Um, so able to use both a video where needed, or at least have that optionality available. Um, I'm trying to think what the third is. There's also a provision right now, just for those who might be leveraging out of state care, uh, excuse me, out of state providers who are licensed in California, but might not be the, located uh, in the state or geographically or far from the patient regarding the ability for the providers to see the patient in person and or um, facilitate warm handoff. So, you know, we're really hopeful that uh, forthcoming guidance will flesh these out um, a little bit, but this is, this is the first step towards the permanent policy, I would say, in my opinion, but um, at least a framework to, to give some predictability as to what it's going to look like. Thanks, Gwen, and I apologize. I'm mistaken. We have more time. For some reason, I had in my head that one o'clock, but we will keep going. Um, any other comments from the panelists related to thoughts on implementing these provisions? Um, Stacey, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that topic. Yeah, sure. You know, um, kind of building again <laughs> um, on, on on discussion of the consent requirements, you know, I, I think well, it's absolutely important and critical that patients have access to care via, um, you know, the modality that they prefer, that the requirements um, of the new consent in the Medi-Cal program, you know, raise a real concern. I think um, that the message patient, patients are going to hear um, is that when they're getting care via a telehealth modality, that they're getting um, substandard care or lesser care, which is, you know, not the case as clinicians are only providing care via a modality that's going to be clinically appropriate um, for the patient and the service. Um, so particularly for those patients who are seeking time-sensitive reproductive and sexual health care services, um, we're concerned that this message could deter some of those patients from getting the care they need. And um, in terms of an impact on provider operations in, in California, you know, we've long had a law that requires patients to consent to the use of telehealth. And um, that consent is, you know, baked into provider workflows. So I hope that as we continue to develop um, and clarify the consent requirements that that be done from a patient-centered perspective and ensure that insofar as these requirements require, you know, a heightened threshold for consent for Medi-Cal patients that they don't serve as a barrier to care for just a subset of patients. Great, thank you, Stacey. Haley, anything you'd add? Yeah, I would tack on just that the department did uh, last week actually convene a subset of the stakeholder uh, work group to preview and get feedback on their model patient consent language. Um, and I actually, what we thought is it was pretty good. Um, we did have a few suggestions that we that we shared with the department, uh, which they are taking back and actually they plan next to float this language with uh, consumer advocates to get their perspective. And then they will release it for public comment. Um, so, so far they've been, you know, pretty open to our suggestions, which is a, a really great improvement. Um, and uh, uh, I would say the other thing I wanted to share is just that the timing <laughs> does make me a little nervous. Um, they do intend to release this language by the end of the year, but we will already um, need to have it implemented by next year. So, um, you know, from a from an implementation standpoint, um, that makes me a little nervous. Yeah. These things take time. Thanks, Haley. Um, so, while the policy conversation is largely focused on audio only, what about the state of asynchronous care sometimes referred to as store and forward. Any thoughts on policies that apply to that modality? Maybe I'll, I'll start with you, Stacey. Yeah, sure. Um, you know, from PPAC's perspective, the policy change to provide um, payment parity for asynchronous telehealth is you know, a significant one. Um, like other care, you know, they 
care that's delivered via um, store and forward modality requires the same level of you know, training, knowledge, and skill, um, the same amount of time, and the same cost to provide as care delivered via other uh, modalities. So a great, a great example of this, I think, is um, the use by several of the California Planned Parenthood affiliates of app-based or web-based care, where a patient is able to access you know, contraceptives through an online app um, or web-based portal. And you know, similarly, a, a lot of follow-up care can be delivered via email, via web, or um, app-based check-in. And so it's incredibly convenient for patients. Um, and with regard to follow-up care, it improves the chances of that actually happening, which um, you know leads to better health outcomes. So I would say in terms of things that still need to be addressed in the you know, area of uh, asynchronous um, policy is the ability, you know, in Medi-Cal to establish new patients using asynchronous telehealth, especially for patients who are seeking access to sexual and reproductive health care. Um, the async care is widely available to patients who seek um, contraception and uh, medication abortion through web and app-based services that are on a cash pay um, basis now. So in not providing patients who are enrolled in Medi-Cal and, and who may not have a pre-existing uh, provider relationship and who can't afford to pay for those services out of pocket um, in, you know, keeping them from the ability to access care that way. I think our current policy creates a real barrier, um, especially for patients who are seeking you know, time-sensitive, incredibly time-sensitive services um, through a provider like ours. Great. Thanks, Cece. Quinn, anything related to just the evolution of asynchronous care policy that you can comment on? Yeah, and, and just to follow up briefly on that, that's this is an area where I think in California could probably lead the way is increased education around asynchronous modalities and how they can really advance care in a quality and cost-effective way. You know, I saw some that 70% of Americans are challenged by the hours where a doctor, when a doctor's office is open. Telehealth can solve a lot, but synchronous modalities like phone or video require the provider and patient to be available at the same time. And so if, if there are clinically appropriate use cases where asynchronous uh, modes or online interviews that are based on evidence guidelines, kind of what Stacey was saying with the provider reviewing the information and, ref and either prescribing where appropriate or referring the patient to other care settings, that could open up a lot of avenues to getting timely care. Um, California, prior to the pandemic, was kind of silent in their Medi-Cal policy as to whether asynchronous could be used to form a relationship. Um, and so it, and then it was permitted during the pandemic. This is something that has been a rollback. And I think it was disappointing outside of a few limited use cases with FQs around um. FQs and someone else can qualify where it is allowed, but you know it's it's an area for improvement and hopefully moving forward again if we focus on the clinician discretion um, and the patient choice to choose the appropriate modality, um, we can hopefully weave in asynchronous um, more moving forward. Great, thank you, Quinn. Um, circling back to our conversation about um, audio only. So as May mentioned early on, there will be payment parity for the audio only provision of telehealth. Um, I'd like to turn to your pan to the panelists to hear your thoughts on the policies, including any additional perceived strengths or weaknesses that you haven't mentioned, um, starting with thinking about the audio only policies and potentially any other uh, elements of uh, the new policies that you would wanna comment on. Uh, maybe I'll start again with Stacey. Yeah, sure. Um, thank you. So um, first, I guess I would note, you know, like asynchronous uh, storm forward, how important the ability to provide services via telephonic audio only telehealth on the same terms as in person care or video is to the Planned Parenthood Health Center providers and their patients, you know, a lot of our patients are unable to access care in person as the result of, you know, geographic, transportation, financial, other social barriers. And um, you know, while we know many patients are unable to utilize synchronous video because of disparities in access, either you know um, to the video technology or internet access necessary to support 
support the modality. Um, patients who are seeking sensitive services, like those that the Planned Parenthood health centers provide, I think face some unique barriers um, in, in that they may not have additionally, you know, access to a private or safe location to conduct a video visit. Um, so the expanded ability to access care via audio only is really significant for the Planned Parenthood patients, especially for those seeking contraceptive care and abortion care. And, you know, that's why we advocated for allowing patients who are seeking sensitive services to be able to establish their care that way. A lot of um, the health center patients who access care um, through Medi-Cal's freedom of choice provisions. Um, those allow um, patients to get sexual and reproductive health care services from any provider. So even if they're out of um, the plans network, um, those patients are in need of time sensitive services and they you know, may not have an existing relationship with our health centers or clinicians. And, and you know, in fact, I'll, some of these patients just visit um, the Planned Parenthood Health Center once. So um, I will just mention too that um, the policy change to allow a provider to establish care with a new patient um, via audio-only telehealth for sensitive services is consistent with um, the DHCS's updated um, um, is it the pandemic, um, the public PHE um, medication abortion policy. So that policy, um, you know, we've been, Planned Parenthood has been working on with our stakeholder partners to advocate that that policy be made permanent and it will um, allow for the provision of medication abortion via telehealth, um, now including audio only telehealth when clinically indicated and when uh, you know, now include new patients who are seeking time sensitive abortion care. So I would say that, yes, the expanded ability to provide care via audio only um, or telephonically, you know, are, are significant improvements. Great. Thank you, Stacey. Haley, anything you'd add? Yeah, the, the audio only provision is super critical um, for our members and the patients they serve. And, you know, I think going back to AB32, AB um, although by the end of session, it was a lot more narrow, um, I think the value of it was really having another vehicle to address telehealth policy that the legislature was moving forward, up, forward with and very supportive of to really bring the department to the table to continue work, working with stakeholders and legislative leaders to make changes to their proposal. Um, if you recall, the original proposal as part of last year's budget was not going to continue covering phone visits at payment parity, and it was not going to allow FPHCs to be able to offer phone visits at all. And at that time, we were really weighing with our members um, and considering what types of utilization controls we could live under even things like caps on the number of phone visits that, that we would provide to patients just to be able to continue delivering care through that modality. Um, and if you also recall, it was the budget committees and the legislature last year at the end of the budget making process that rejected the administration's proposal and instead voted to adopt the language that was in AB 32. And so we ended up landing on this compromise to have the department continue um, to work with us to develop the permanent policy that, that we have today. Um, so if that hadn't happened and we hadn't advanced AB 32 as a strong alternative to the administration's proposal that had really strong support in the legislature, it's certainly possible that, that we would be in a different position today and having a much um, different conversation. So I just wanted to you know, remind everyone of that context as well. Thank you, Haley. I'd like to shift a little bit to thinking about the federal landscape. We've gotten a few questions in the queue, but um, as we get to those, you know, during COVID licensure issues really rose to the forefront because telehealth, you know, is considered rendered as we talked about at the location of the patient, meaning that providers have to be licensed in the state where the patient is located. And then we touched a little bit on how the Dobbs decision handed uh, that was handed down further highlighted a host of issues affecting the practice of medicine and other disciplines across state lines. What are some of the general perspectives on cross-state licensure and perhaps even more on the implications of the Dobbs decision on California providers? Glenn, maybe we'll start with you. Sure. Um, 
so I think going back once again to when the pandemic started, I believe every state implemented some type of, including California, some type of licensure flexibility temporarily. You, as a general matter, need to be licensed in the state where the patient is located. Um, over the last two years, we've seen states take um, make that permanent in a lot of different ways. There's no state that I'm aware of that has full licensure reciprocity. If you're in good standing in one state, you can deliver telehealth across state lines. Um, just as a general matter, what they have done is there's a number of occupational compacts, physicians, uh, nurse practitioners, nurses, occupational therapists that have grown, um, psychologists that have grown exponentially with their participation over the last two years um, that really makes it easier to deliver care across state lines. That's kind of one one pathway that states have taken. Um, another pathway is for certain professions, particularly behavioral health, to allow um, really expedited licensure or certification to practice. A third model in Florida, Arizona, West Virginia is a registration. Again, it's more of a streamlined process to be able to deliver telehealth in the state. And then the fourth, and May kind of touched on this, we haven't seen it happen yet. I think the next session we will see it quite a bit. Uh, the Federation of State Medical Boards just endorsed um, this in their model policy, which are, I call them common sense exceptions to licensure, where there's continuity of care across state lines, a college student um, who is traveling, being able to still talk to their therapist, a follow-up from a surgery visit, or contacting a specialist. Um, this falls in what I call thinking of new models of care. Um, this is my opinion, somewhere where California could make some ground. Uh, California is one of three states that has enacted zero compacts, not one. Um, so this is somewhere where going forward, I think if we are gonna leverage telehealth beyond the geographic vicinity of the patient and get them care when and where it's needed, we you know, should think about ways to, to make it easier for providers to meet those needs. Great, thanks Shane. Thank you, Quinn. Cece? Yeah, so I'll I'll sort of take the you know Dobbs approach I think here. So um, you know while it's really hard, um, I think impossible to overstate how you know absolutely devastating the Dobbs decision has been um, for abortion providers and for patients across the country. You know California has done an exceptional amount of work in terms of preparing for what was you know a, a real inevitability following the death of Justice Ginsburg in, in 2020. And so just over a year ago, Governor Newsom called on um, you know, reproductive freedom and sexual and reproductive healthcare stakeholders to convene and, and make recommendations about what our state could do right, to address the impending threat to abortion rights and, and abortion access. And so the California Future of Abortion Council, um, you know, with participation of over 40 organizations, including policymakers, researchers, advocates, providers, um, and patients developed a, a set of about 45 policy recommendations, you know, a, a, to address that. And so those recommendations were reflected in, in part in a large bill package, some of which um, directly addressed some of these cross-state issues um, as we know that patients from states with abortion bans are, are going to see care from providers in states like California. So um, uh, Dr. Grossman touched on, I think, um, at least one of them in his opening remarks, but I just wanted to highlight, um, you know, Assembly Bill 2626 by Assembly Member Calderon um, prevents um, the California Medical Board from revoking or suspending a medical license um, for providing abortion care in another state. Um, Assembly Member Bonta's um, AB 2091 will enhance privacy protections for medical records related to abortion care. And I, I saw there was a, I'm not good at um, thinking and reading at the same time, but I saw a question in the chat related to privacy um, and I'll touch on that. But um, also Assembly Member Bauer Cahan's um, 1666, which I think Dr. Grossman mentioned to um, protect California, California providers and others um, from enforcement of civil judgments obtained based on other states' um, anti-abortion laws. So as far as, you know, legal limits, um, as others have said, with cross-state licensure, specifically in general, the um, laws of the state in which the patient is located um, applies and, and those sort of 
laws vary, um, as we know. So the reality is, though, I think that we're in somewhat of an uncharted territory right now legally um, when it comes to some of these issues of jurisdiction and the extent to which we can uh, provide care to out-of-state patients while protecting providers and patients from laws in, in states with hostile abortion um, laws. So uh, I think we're likely to see some challenges to some of our new laws, and we're likely to see new legislative efforts in ban states um, to address what we've done this year in our legislature as, as those state legislatures reconvene. Um, I would say as much as possible that the folks working to ensure abortion access continue to do the work in, in collaboration, since it's going to be, you know, crucial that we continue to carefully consider potential limits and potential un unintended consequences, you know, on both patients and providers um, of new policy proposals. So, you know, I'm saying both in the context of abortion, but also um, on delivery of healthcare more broadly. So, you know, that's why I, I, I think the Fab Council um, has been and is um, so critical and so helpful so that folks can get together and share out their different perspectives on, on proposals. And um, it's definitely something that Planned Parenthood looks forward to um, continuing this upcoming year with all of our partners. And Cece, on the privacy thing, the question that came up in the chat was around California's privacy laws and how, um, uh, how they may help limit cross state data shares, especially as it relates to reproductive health. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, you know, um, Assembly Member Bonta's um, 2091, which I referenced, um, does place limits on um, um, providing medical records related to abortion um, um, and subpoenas related to out of state. Um, sorry, to, to limits on our state um, complying with out-of-state subpoenas um, for medical records when they're related to abortion. So um, there are some limits in place. And I, I think too that as we talk about um, doing evaluation, data collection, and analysis, um, that that is an area that we're going to want to kind of keep front of mind is, is how to collect data so that we can understand the, the landscape, but also make sure um, that we're protecting, you know, patients from, from adverse consequences in their home states. Great. Quinn, anything you would add very large, uh, on a broader context related to um, privacy and sharing data across states? Just that I think we're going to be talking about it for the next four to five years. I, I, I think this is, you know, there are certain places where telehealth I believe it, you know, needs to, it, it always needs to follow the standard of care, but some of the telehealth specific legislation I think could be solved by just referencing current standards and not singling it out as a care setting. There are some unique considerations in telehealth related to privacy. And I think over the next few years, those will continue to be tackled. Um, and again, we have, a, we, we have a 50 state framework on this, which can inhibit, um, you know, the scaling of certain services. Um, so I, I, there's been movement for a federal solution. I don't think that is going to happen um, this session, but who knows, it, it could in the future, but it's definitely gonna be top of mind. Great. Okay, um, I wanna jump to um, uh, kind of our, our rounding out conversation. I would like to ask each of you, what is one area you would like to see policymakers address in their next legislative session? Um, we'll go ahead and start with Haley. Yeah, um, you know, I do think there are some areas of telehealth and virtual care that are still kind of untapped. And one area that we've heard a lot of strong interest in uh, further exploring from our members is remote patient monitoring and how this can kind of be leveraged to support patient care and improve health outcomes. Um, I know there are some smaller pilots going on around the state and some of our members have seen really significant and positive improvements in health outcomes. And so it's kind of thinking about how that can be leveraged and scaled up um, so that it's just more integrated in the healthcare safety net. Um, one of our consultants shared that remote patient monitoring is, is basically like how telehealth was before COVID. Um, there's a lot of promise, but still a lot of confusion on how to do it and how to get it paid for with providers. 
And although Medi-Cal does currently cover some of the RPM codes, they don't, to my understanding, cover any uh, services to manage patients that are using RPM, which is something that really will be needed, um, as well as just more TA on this for providers to understand how to integrate it with their care delivery and, and how to be able to bill for it. Great. Thank you, Haley. I, too, am hearing lots of interests around RPM across the state and lots of small pilots that are looking to scale and looking for the resources to do that. I think that's an important topic. Uh, Quinn, what would you say the priorities uh, should be? Um, building off of what I kind of said earlier, I, I would hope that the policies going forward continue to think a little bit more about the workforce shortage and leveraging um, our policies to ensure care can be delivered when and where it's needed. Um, the Medicaid uh, policy that passed, I mentioned this earlier, has, has a provision in it that, that almost limits telehealth providers to be in the geographic proximity of the patient. Uh, that is unique now to Medicaid beneficiaries. It's another singling out. Um, so to really think of making sure that we're leveraging telehealth to get the providers that are needed and whether that's through some of the common sense licensure exceptions that I've raised earlier or whether through thinking through this Medicaid policy to make sure somebody who wants to see a specialist, a behavioral health specialist that might work um, on gender affirming issues is able to see that if it's not in their geographic proximity. So um, that's what I'm hopeful. On. And as I said, California has led the way in a lot of places and I'm, I'm hoping they address this moving forward. Great, thanks, Quinn. Stacey? Yeah, you know, um, in the context of the provision of sexual and reproductive health care and, you know, te telehealth, I think the big issue that comes to mind um, in the new post-ops legal landscape, I just touched on it, is around um, data privacy and the need to protect information about patients who are seeking abortion and other care um, that may be banned in their home state. Um, as the state moves forward with efforts to do um, more expansion on data exchange and to evaluate provision of care via telehealth, I think it's critical to keep um, front of mind the fact that there is you know, serious risk to out-of-state patients who are seeking abortion and potentially to their providers, um, and that we, we think about how best to protect them within that. Um, that said, you know, the Fab Council is just beginning um, its work to plan for the upcoming legislative session. And, you know, we look forward to working with our partners to identify, you know, what are ongoing barriers to access and to workshop solutions to, um, you know, address those and expand access. Great. Thank you, Stacey. And thank you, everyone, for highlighting those um, priority issues that you see. Um, last question would be uh, for the group. Any resources that you would recommend to our, our listeners on how to track some of this and how to stay up to date as well as um, resources that may be available related to some of the conversation we had? That was a shameless plug. <laughs> there is no one that tracks statewide developments better than CCHP and nobody that's more on top of in California than the California Telehealth Coalition. So please join, subscribe to the weekly Tuesday newsletter. That's where I learn everything I need to know. Um, yeah, it's there's a lot and it's changing rapidly and nobody's on top of it like CCHB. Great. Thank you. Well, with that, I think we have gotten through most of our questions. I want to thank our wonderful and brilliant panelists for your thoughtful responses and for your leadership on these issues. I also want to thank um, the team that leads our work at the California Health Policy Coalition. And um, uh, I think with that, we um, can adjourn. Or May, are you going to say anything else? Yes. First off, let me just add my thanks to, again, all the panels and also to you, Diana, for that great moderation. Thank you so much. I'm just going to share a couple of slides in case for folks here. Just give me a second again. Thank you to Diana and our panelists, uh, Dr. Grossman, Dr. Pfeiffer, Haley, Quinn, and Stacy. You guys were terrific. I know I learned a lot and I'm sure our audience did as well, too. And also there's like a lot of food for thoughts there. So I'm sure we're all going to get a lot of questions over the next couple of 
couple of months here. So just really quickly, the coalition is also having our annual meeting. It is open, so you don't have to like be a member right now to also come and attend or listen in to the meeting. It will be in a hybrid format. We'll be meeting in person, but also you can access it online as well too. It is on November 10th from 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. There is a registration link. Um, the recording of this session, this webinar, as well as the PowerPoint slides will also be made available on the CCHP website. So you can just download those to get all that information as well. Once again, thank you to our generous sponsors for this event, the California Healthcare Foundation, the Center for Connected Health Policy, Teladoc Health, and AARP California. And again, if you have any questions regarding the coalition or today's discussion, please feel free to reach out to CCHP staff. There's also information on CCHP, CCHP's website regarding the coalition. Once more, thank you to our panelists. Thank you to Diana for her great moderation here. And thank you everyone for attending today. Hope everyone stays well, um, stay safe, and we will see you soon. Have a great day, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you.